uh, working through part of this lesson uh, while I was on a flight, and uh, the idea came up of the title, and I'll explain later, but uh, Fernando and I were, were on a flight, and uh, I think we were coming from a conference, or I, I, I was thinking, like, what was it? Maybe it was Women's Day when I preached in L.A., but um, we we're on this flight, and everything's going okay, and then all of a sudden, you know how they, the, the sound starts coming up, you know, the beeping, and then um, they're like, okay, please come back to your seats and buckle up. We're, good, we're experiencing, there's, there's some thunderstorms, okay? So I'm like, oh, no, when that happens, I usually get... You know, there was just like terrible turbulence. And I turn and I look at Fernando and he's like fast asleep. And I'm like, okay, he's like, like Jesus asleep in the middle of the storm, okay? And I'm over here like on my phone and I'm like texting my sin list and I'm like, you know, texting, <laughs> texting Andrea and Nati and telling them how much I love them and, you know, uh, give my last final words. And it's like, seriously, they know that I texted them. And, um, <laughs> We end up having this emergency landing, and out of all places, we end up landing in El Paso, Texas, which is where I used to live. I lived there for about four years, and Andrea and Nati were born there. But we land there, and um, we're there maybe like 10 minutes, and people are already like, let us out. You know, how, like, how long are we going to be here? I'm like, it's only been 10 minutes, you know? Um, and then um, it's pouring raining. People are coughing, babies are crying, uh, you know, the, the dogs that are supposed to be support dogs, they're barking, even they're stressed out. And, uh, and then after an hour of sitting there, I start feeling like I need to get out. Like, I, I'm starting to feel like I need to get out of here, you know? And I start feeling like that feeling of like trapped, like you can't get out, like you want to get out, but you can't. And I don't know if you guys have felt like that ever, but maybe on an elevator or in a, in a room or in a car, you know? And none of us like feeling like that, right? Trapped. Sometimes there's a potential of us being trapped by our own minds, okay? Where, where we're stuck. And all of us are carrying around a mindset. So you woke up today with a certain frame of mind. Like you walked into this room with a certain frame of mind. And a mindset is, is basically the way that you're thinking. It's a mentality. And our mind leads to our feelings and then our feelings, our heart, then our actions. So it's really important that we take care of our mind, okay? So there's a quote from Helen Keller. Okay, Helen Keller is, you guys probably have heard of Helen Keller, she's an author and an educator, and she was born blind and deaf. And she says, self-pity is our worst enemy. And if we yield to it, we can never do anything wise in this world. If there was anyone <laughs> that could have felt like self-pity, it could have been her, right? She can't see, she can't hear. Um, so tonight, I wanna talk about this mind, okay? A mind trap. Okay, and uh, the title of my lesson is The Mind Trap of Victim Mentality. Okay. So, and maybe you're already thinking, ooh, I know exactly who this is good for. Like that one sister or like my family member, you know? Okay, so don't think that way. I want you to like push that aside. <laughs> okay, allow God to work on your mind first. Okay. What is in your mind that could maybe lean towards a victim mentality, okay? And I want you to know that everything that I'm teaching you today is something, and what I, what I come up here and teach you guys is something that I've either been through, worked through, or currently working through that I'm studying out, okay? So, and, and this also like started in Mexico City. We had a lot of conversations there, and, and it kept, I felt like it kept coming up in other people and, and me too. So this was good for me to study out, okay? So let's start off with defining it. So a victim, according to Webster's Dictionary, is a person who has been attacked, injured, robbed, killed, cheated, or fooled by someone else, or harmed by an unpleasant event, okay? So sadly, many of us here in the room, including myself, have been attacked, have been injured, cheated, fooled, and harmed during our life, right? If not physically, then mentally. And everyone gets harmed by unpleasant events, sadly. So we're all victims in moments in our life. 
right? There's challenges and difficulties that happen. The Bible even talks about this. Challenges are going to come. But tonight I want to talk about the victim mentality that can sometimes develop as a result of having been through a difficult situation. Uh, but where these situations are actually meant, like God uses these situations so that you can learn and grow and be more like Christ. But instead, we become stuck and trapped feeling like victims, okay? So that's what I want to talk about tonight. So I want you to think about this, okay? Instead of thinking of myself as a victim, what would it look like for me to think of myself as a survivor? Or even better, as an overcomer, okay? And this could open up, like thinking this way could open up a, a lot of new ways. Like it could open up new thoughts and would help you to move past some of the consequences that happen from a victim mentality. I wanna look through a few um, victim traps, okay? Like some characteristics of someone with a victim mentality. And I got, these from, I got this from a book uh, called, um, I think a rejection mindset, um, and it's a there's a chapter in it that talks about victim mentality. So these are not. Don't think, oh, she's talking about me. You know, she. <laughs> like I got this from this. Most of them are from this book. Okay, so number one, a lack of responsibility for sinful behavior. If you have a victim mentality, you lack responsibility for for sinful behavior. So this could be like you sinned in your anger, like you had a fit of rage. But somehow this ends up not being your sin. Like someone else is responsible for this fit of rage, for you acting this way. Which leads to blaming others for your sin of why you did something. So you're innocent and everyone else is guilty. Okay? Um, a lack of responsibility for not applying God's word and growing and changing. Okay, number four, complaining entitlement attitude and expectations. I expect this to be done this way. Having a God is against me or God is punishing me kind of mindset. A lack of gratitude. Like it's okay, but it, it really should have been better. Um, you know, not being content and comparing it to something else or how someone else used to do something. Um, also a lack mentality, meaning you never have enough. You're always lacking. Like God doesn't provide enough entitlement, like money, resources, blessings. I never have enough. Uh, uh, number seven, problem focused. Negative view of God's actions. Refusal to examine your weaknesses with a view to improve and actually change them. Stiff neck. Do you guys know what that is? So it's like refuse instruction or correction. Like no one can correct you because you're saying you're getting triggered. And maybe this, this actually triggered you, <laughs> okay? So <laughs> lack of responsibility for outcomes, like everything is just outside of my control. Like I can't control this. Jealousy, envy towards other people's blessings. Or wallow in self-pity, like God deals more harshly with me. So-and-so has it easier because she's prettier, she's younger, or she has that type of husband, and that's why she can do what she does. Okay, resentful, bitter, and unforgiving towards others and God. Or exaggerated, exaggerating your problems. Like they're very small, but you spiral, and they become super big. Um, like something happens, and all of a sudden it's like, this is why I can't do this. I shouldn't be doing this. Okay, and there's more, but these are the ones that stood out. Okay, so I'm thinking maybe like we can relate to at least one of these things, right? Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> all, all of these characteristics, okay, maybe more than one, I don't know. Okay, <laughs> so all of these characteristics are keeping you from growing. They're keeping you trapped and stuck in the same place. So sisters, the victim mentality is Satan tempting you to quit fighting for what God has promised you? And tonight I want to see a person who had a victim mentality and how Jesus deals with that, okay? So let's turn to John 5. John 5, and we're going to start reading in verse 1. And my first point is confront and replace your story. Confront and replace your story. John 5, verse 1. 
It says, Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to, li used to lie. The blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked them, do you want to get well? Another translation says, do you want to be made well? So Jesus knew that this man didn't get sick like a week ago, right? He was in this condition for 38 years, and this is it gripped most of his life. One thing that Jesus knew is that someone who has a disease for a long time can actually end up wrapping their identity around their infirmity or their situation, okay? So, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about me because you guys already know about me, but, okay, so I, I wanna relate to the scripture, okay? So, I, sadly, I was abandoned, okay, by my father when I was young. I was also molested by a family member when I was young. I was held hostage in a third world country for a week. And I saw, while I was held hostage there, I saw people die. I saw people bleed to death and die. And, you know, uh, I saw a lot of like painful things and, and I had people hurt me, you know, and, and uh, that I loved, both inside the kingdom and outside the kingdom, okay? And the list goes on and on. If we're not careful, if I'm not careful, what Satan throws against us can end up becoming who we are. Like, I could currently be like, oh, I'm fatherless. Like, I'm uh, abused. I'm held hostage. You know, and, but, but I'm not. I'm not any of these things anymore, right? I, I'm a survivor. I'm an overcomer. And, and I'm new in Christ. And you guys have your own story, you know, maybe abusive parents, maybe an abusive relationship, uh, maybe you were treated differently growing up than your siblings or than other people around you, maybe you were hurt by others in some way, so many different situations, but what does Jesus do? What does Jesus do in the scripture? Jesus asks him a question, right? The question Jesus asks, confronts the victim mentality, like right from the start. And it could come across as if Jesus is being a little insensitive, <laughs> right? He doesn't ask this man's story. Like there's no intake done, okay? If you're in the medical field, you know what I'm talking about, right? The intake of like, you know, you're trying to figure out their like background and trying to figure out where to send them. No, Jesus doesn't do this. Jesus is like, do you want to be made well? He cuts right to the heart. Do you really want to be healed or do you want to live on your mat? Right, right. And to the average reader, this is going to maybe come up as a, like a silly question. You know, who would want to stay sick? Yeah. And as I'm reading this, I'm like, just say yes. Yes, I want to get well. <laughs> but we don't see that. Instead, we see that he's telling his story. The story that Jesus didn't ask for. In verse 7, in verse 7, the man who was sick, it says, read verse 7, it says, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I'm coming, another steps down before me. And Jesus didn't even ask that. <laughs> How many times have you said the same story to someone? And they kindly say, oh yeah, I remember you mentioning that. <laughs> Maybe like twice or maybe three times. I mean, who's counting? But <laughs> he just needed a yes or a no answer. And a victim mindset doesn't know how to answer a direct question like that. Because what that does is that it draws a line in the sand. It makes someone have and take personal responsibility instead of putting it on someone else. If he says yes, then he is personally responsible from now on. But if he says no, he looks like a fool. <laughs> but if he says yes, he can no longer blame anyone else for what happened to him. 
So instead, he gives a list of reasons of why he hasn't been able to get into this pool. And let's be honest, okay? If we really, okay, this guy was there for 38 years. You would think that in 38 years, you can kind of inch your way, right? I'm, I'm pretty sure, 38 years. Or, or you can think of a, something like, guys, if you get me in, as soon as I'm healed, I'll pay you. Like, I'll go work and I'll pay you. Like, I don't know, think of a plan, right? But no, instead, he was so stuck where he was that his answer was the story. And all of us, if we're not careful, we can carry a story within us that is not the story that God meant to use to make you more like Christ. God's story for you isn't meant to be a narrative of unhealed pain, of limited power, of distorted uh, perspectives, of all this stuff, of my, my family this, my you know, teacher that, all this stuff. It's like that's not what God was, was working on your life to do. And this man was being given a chance to confront and replace his story to show God's healing power. You know, years ago, I remember um, we were at a conference. A lot of things happen at a conference, so guys, go to conferences, okay? So I remember going to a conference, and we met, this, we met up with this couple that we love. They're, they're not here, but this couple we really respect, and um, he, they're like, uh, like our fathers in, and mom in the faith. So we're sitting there, and I'm telling them this story. <laughs> and I had said this story before to them, probably more than once. Uh, of how I felt mistreated, you know, from, from before, and, uh, and how I, like, didn't agree with how things were handled, and, you know, I kept talking about it, and, and, and during this time, as I'm explaining this, for a, for a short, like, instant, I kind of felt like a false sense of peace. Like, it's not my fault. I'm a victim in this. They're the ones that did this. So as I'm talking, I'm like, wow, like I actually don't have to do anything. <laughs> like that, this is their fault. They did me wrong. <laughs> and then <laughs> we pray. And then the brother's like, God, please be with Jackie. And, and uh, you know, help her with not having a victim mindset. <laughs> And I'm like, I'm like, come again? I, I, I mean, amen? What? And then I go back, and I'm like, a oh, victim. A uh, victim mindset? Okay. And, and I was like, what? The enemy was using this to keep me stuck. I was straight stuck. I was not growing in my love for the lost. I didn't want to lead. Why? Because I didn't want to get hurt again. Like, I don't want to go through the same thing that I went through before. So what was I doing? I was, I was taking control of my own life <laughs> and deciding what I was going to do. And I was limiting God's power. And I was not loving the weak because I didn't want to get hurt. <laughs> so I wasn't putting my heart out there. And I was so focused on how I had been wronged. And I needed to look in the mirror and actually confront myself. You know, and, and I, I was looking at it and I was thinking, wow, I realized that I was hurting other people <laughs> by not giving my heart. And they hurt me, yes, but I think they hurt me because they themselves had unresolved, unresolved hurt in their life, wow. right? And it becomes this cycle that Satan works through within all of us. They hurt me, so I hurt someone else, and, on, and then they hurt someone else, and on and on it goes. This victim mentality of just hurting one another. And Satan loves that. And I had to see, what can I learn from this about myself that God is trying to help me to be made well? What did I learn about God through this, his character? What can I learn about the enemy, about how, he's, how he works with, it, with me, how he's trying to get me? And I was able to see how I was resentful and bitter towards them 
and towards God, but I was hiding behind the, they hurt me. I'm, I'm just hurt. No, you're bitter. <laughs> Jackie, you're bitter and you're resentful and you're hiding behind the, they hurt me. That's not true. Okay, so we got resolved, you know, with, with this, it was, it was basically a, a couple. We got resolved with them and now, you know, we spend time, we laugh about it. We could even laugh about it. That's how God can restore, right? So sisters, reflect on the following. Does your story show God's healing power? Or does it show your wounds instead of your scars? Do you retell your story with unhealed pain where people leave feeling bad for you? Or they leave hating someone that hurt you? You know, instead of seeing Jesus in your story and how you're a healed daughter of God, we need to let go of retelling all the reasons why we are who we are based on our past or current situations that have been hurtful lately, okay? We need to change our story and stop being trapped with why we think we cannot grow, why we can't change, why we can't be a good mom, why we can't be a good leader, why we can't be a disciple, why we can't break free because of something that happened to us. We have to stop that, okay? So, so sisters, apply pain, uh, uh, sorry, our painful history does not have to be a painful future, okay? So um, identify your story and see if there's anything you need to heal, then decide to retell it, not as a victim, but as a victor, okay? As an overcomer full of Jesus' healing power. <laughs> it's slowly going down, but I'm not going to be bitter. <laughs> okay? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Amen. Okay, so point number two. Do the opposite of what you think by doing what he says. Jesus, okay, what Jesus says. Okay, so John 5. So let's keep reading. Verse 8. Okay. Verse 8. It says, Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. So Jesus asks him to do something that kind of seemed impossible. Like, this man is paralyzed. Yeah. Right? And he's like, get up. What do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean get up? And in that moment, he has a choice either to retell his story again on why he can't, or he can say, can't you see that I'm paralyzed? Yeah. But instead, he silences the enemy and did exactly what Jesus told him to do. Yeah. And what happens? He's healed. He finds a new level of freedom and personal responsibility in his life. So there's a healing power in complete obedience. It doesn't have to feel right. It just is right <laughs> if God says it. Because I'm sure he's thinking, this doesn't feel right. I'm trying to get up, and I haven't done this for 38 years or more. Right? But he does it. Remember, we are victims only to the greatest extent that our mind allows us to accept it. So we are a victim as much as our mind allows us to be a victim, okay? We are overcomers because Jesus says we are. This is who he says we are. What does this man do? He does the opposite of what his victim mentality was telling him to do. He does something that's radical. He, okay, let's, let's go to Romans 12. We're going to actually come back to, I think, we'll, yeah, we're going to come back to John 5, but let's go to Romans 12, 21, or you can listen to me read it. It's a short, powerful scripture, okay? Romans 12, 21. It says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. It's like a short, powerful scripture, right? <laughs> Very direct. God is calling you to do the opposite of what you feel you should do. God is calling you to do what may seem impossible and or unreasonable. 
But when you do exactly what he says through complete obedience, an incredible sense of healing comes your way, just like it did with this man. And tonight, God is calling you to forgive who hurt you, pray for them, break off the worldly relationships, and pursue your relationship with God instead. To fully trust the person in your life and don't apply your past experiences on them. Why? Because they weren't the ones that did it. <laughs> and usually, even with those people that did that, it's the evil, it's Satan who works through them. Yeah. Right? If we understand that. What is the radical thing that you know that you need to do to see God's healing power in your life? And I know that you know it. Because for a lot of us, we've been through a cycle and we kind of already know what our sin is. And we kind of already know what Satan's going after in our lives. So you probably already know what I'm talking about. What is the radical thing that you need to do in order to see God's healing power? Hi. So if you're studying the Bible, clear out your schedule this week. Make the decision to make Jesus Lord of your life this by the end of this week on Sunday. You know, or it could be to embrace the challenges that God has given to you to surrender and choose to fully obey him. God's healing power is within all of our reach, you know, and escape. And this helps us to escape Satan's trap. As you do the opposite of what you think and do what Jesus wants you to do or what he asks you to do. Okay, so point number three. Point number three. Let's. We're going to go back to John 5. Point number three says, remember who made you well. And go tell. <laughs> remember who made you well and go tell. Okay, so John 5, verse, we're going to do, uh, start off in verse 12. It says, so they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick up your mat and walk? The man who was, he who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Eek. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. Okay, man. <laughs> he quickly went... So the man gets healed by Jesus, but he doesn't really know that it was Jesus who healed him, okay? And Jesus finds him in the temple area doing what? We don't know what he's doing. But Jesus can see his thoughts, and he can see the state of his heart. And maybe he saw that the man was doing something he shouldn't be doing. <laughs> so he tells him what? He says, stop sinning. He says, stop sinning. In other words, like actually repent like did you see that i healed you you know like repent that is why it says repentance brings refreshment because you're healed and you can be you know uh jesus is lord on sunday and then by wednesday you're like oh my gosh this is harder than i thought <laughs> Well, Jesus is saying, continue to just live in repentance, obey, and that's what's going to continue to bring refreshment in your life, right? So, uh, let's see, he tells him, stop sinning, and then Jesus warns him. He says, look, I healed you, right? But now, don't take that for granted. You know, look what I've done for you. And let this motivate us, right, to stay far away from sin, Otherwise, you'll go right back to being trapped by the victim mentality, you know, where you'll, you could probably spend the next 38 years, you know, back on your mat. And we don't want to do that. The great sign of someone that has been freed from the mind trap of victim mentality is someone who is filled with gratitude. Who instead of focusing on themselves, instead of focusing on what it's going to bring them pleasure, or instead of focusing on what's going to be easier, they focus on actually being grateful for their lives and helping others to be healed, yeah. right? Because those who are healed heal others. Those who have been freed, free, free others. And those who have been hurt, hurt others. Yeah. Those who stay hurt will continue to hurt others. Yeah. 
And the man goes and he tells the Jewish leaders boldly and unashamed that it was Jesus who did this. Why? Because he remembered who made him well, so he went to tell, <laughs> right? He was filled with so much gratitude as Jesus did, you know, did not, like he, he was so filled with gratitude. He had been there for 38 years and finally he's being heal, healed. And this is why we are to focus on saving a lost world, why we need to focus on evangelizing, why we need to give our hearts to like campaigns, you know, uh, to grow the church, to, to see Samaria, right? The Samaria Project at that. And we've been healed so that we can help others be healed as well. So let's, let's, go, to, um, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 23. I'm almost done, guys. Don't fall asleep. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23. Okay, so it says, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. So Christ, our supreme example, Christ, okay, he's our supreme example of someone who was victimized but who actually overcame a victim mentality. This is who Jesus is. He could have been a victim or had this mentality, but he didn't. And I don't know about you, but for me, it's difficult to watch the passion of the Christ, you know, like so, some of those things. And those are just some small, some of the th major things maybe that they show, but there's other things that they don't show. Like they literally plucked out Jesus's beard. Did you know that? You can see commentaries on this. They spat on him. They offered him vinegar to drink. They mocked his kingship. Um, they put a crown of thorns on his head. And then they, they hung him on a cross, right? And Jesus, the difference is that he was completely innocent. And there was no deceit found in him, right? Nothing, no sin. If anyone had the right to have a victim mentality, it could have been Jesus. It would be Jesus. And could you imagine, though, how much, how differently we would see Jesus if he was constantly complaining of the ill treatment and how everyone was making his life so difficult? Like, could you imagine how different we would see Jesus, <laughs> right? If he was constantly complaining, could you imagine if he came out of the grave and he was, like, vowing, like, vengeance? <laughs> that would be can you imagine if after his resurrection, he walked around feeling sorry for himself? Like self-pity? But instead, we see that Christ, at his lowest moment, he refuses. He refuses to sin. And he refuses to carry anything out on his critics, on his murder, like people that murdered him, on the people that were spitting at him, accusing him. Jesus puts himself in the hands of God, right? He puts himself in the hands of God who judges justly. There is no victim mentality in Jesus. In fact, even while they were crucifying him, he said, Father, forgive them. He's not bitter. He's not bitter about what happened to him. He shows us how to live lives as victors, as overcomers he's a great example of someone who overcame the abuse that he lived in his life so let's close out in Isaiah 61 Isaiah 61 so we have to remember who who the victim is okay the victim was Jesus Isaiah 61 verse 1 and I love this scripture. It says, The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, 
to proclaim freedom for the, cap for the captives and release from the darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. And when I read the scripture, it makes me emotional. I love, I love this scripture. I see a new creation. I see an old coming to a new type of mindset. And this is who God has called us to be. He hasn't called us to have to be victim thinkers, you know. He wants, it says here in the scripture, he wants to exchange that. You see it? He wants to exchange that. He wants us to be women who can confidently proclaim the good news. He wants to give us beauty for ashes. When we are victim thinkers, we are surrounded by ashes. And he wants to exchange that for beauty. He wants to exchange our mourning. And when we are victim thinkers, we can't be consoled by God. We're in a, a cycle of constant mourning. But he wants to exchange that. He says the oil of joy. He wants to give us joy instead of mourning. He wants us to praise him instead of having a spirit of despair. And God wants to make us a tree of righteousness that can actually handle storms that come our way. Guys, if you guys are going through something, okay, I'm in my 40s, but if you guys are in like teens, if you guys are in your 20s and you guys are going through something right now, like we need to see it as something that God is trying to get our roots. He describes it. He wants to, us to be a, a oak, a righteous oak with roots that are super deep so that we can actually make it to heaven. If you guys are going through something right now, Believe me, it's, it's there to make you strong for some of the things that are to come. And, and it's not even to come because you're a Christian. Things are going to happen whether or not you're a Christian. Okay? Bad things happen to whether you're a Christian or not. But God is trying to make you into a strong oak tree where your roots are deep and you're not going to crumble when the storm comes. He wants us to be women who are well watered, deeply rooted in his word and to display God's glory to the world around us. This is, this is who God wants us to be. Okay, he wants us to exchange our past for this. So sisters, we are women who aren't trapped in our mind with a victim mentality. We are not just survivors. We are overcomers. I love you guys. To God be the glory.